and they were camped there by the water. The people, uh, they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what had obviously happened by the sixth week? <clears throat> what has happened at this point? They'd run out of food, yes. All right. So they ran out of food and they were asking in a somewhat more obnoxious way, what are we going to eat? Okay. Yahweh yeah, said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, the evening, now look, this chapter is, is a, is a chronological nightmare, but it's very important to us because it's the Sabbath before Sinai chapter. So let's see if we can straighten this out. The people asked, what are we to eat? Then the Lord said to Moses, verse 4, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And included in there is the Sabbath gathering on the sixth day. Verse 6, so Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of Yahweh, because he has heard your murmurings against Yahweh. For what are we that you murmur against us? Now verse 8 has long been noted by scholars to be a nonsense verse that doesn't say anything in Hebrew. It doesn't make a sentence. I know that it makes a sentence in your English Bibles. Why is that? because the translators made it make a sentence even though it's gibberish. Let's skip verse 8 because there may have been pieces left over from an original sentence there, but whatever the sentence was, it isn't there now. What are we that you murmur against us? Do you see how it says what are we there in verse 8 again? It's uh, apparently somewhere along the way there was some damage that somebody has tried to fix up and made a mess of. Now verse 9, And Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before Yahweh, for he has heard your murmurings. Now you notice that he has given them the answer and told them how their need is going to be fulfilled in, by the end of verse 7. It's all clear and it's all done. They've asked the question, they've gotten the answer. Then in verse 9, Moses is saying, Come near before Yahweh, for he's heard your murmurings. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. And Yahweh said to Moses, I have heard the murmurings of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God. So God sort of announces what he's going to do at the end of where Moses had already told the people what was going to happen. Right? There is a chronological problem, um, an apparent chronological problem. The uh, explanation for this mangled chapter is that it isn't mangled at all, something is left out. When you compare the other passages where the glory of the Lord appears in the cloud, what happens every time is this. There's a complaint. The complaint results in an argument among the people. I'll give you one of the examples. The story of the 12 spies. Because there's an argument among the people, Moses gives his judgment. The people, or the majority of the people, don't accept his judgment. Then God appears in the cloud 
and pronounces his final judgment which accords with what Moses has already said. Okay? In every one of the stories of this type, that's the pattern. What's missing from this chapter then? It makes all the sense in the world. What's missing from the chapter? The argument. It doesn't say that there was an argument between the faithful and the unfaithful about trusting God for food. You do understand, don't you, that the book of Exodus is edited together from longer sources? Why they didn't tell the whole argument here, I'm not sure. Except that perhaps in its final form, the editor didn't want to get waylaid by the arguments among the people this early. I think he did it for theological reasons. He wanted to show that they got worse as they went along. Okay? Because that's his theological viewpoint, that they got worse as they went along. Okay? Once you realize that Moses is giving his reaction to an argument among the people, and that, that God then enters in when Moses' statement isn't accepted, and comes to his rescue and pronounces his judgment, there's no problem at all with chronology or anything else. Now how did I find this pattern? You have to read the rest of the stories where the Lord suddenly appears in the cloud to find out what the sequence is. And then you notice that what is here is in exactly the same sequence. And that's what reveals to you that... Now, a lot of text critics would rewrite the text, okay? Form critics would say, oh, these verses are all from different sources and so forth. There's nothing like that. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. Now here again, we're not dealing with a supernatural phenomenon, but what we're dealing with is the timing. Why? Ever since the 17th century, commentators on the book of Exodus have been pointing out that what? That in the spring migrations, the birds coming from Central Africa and going back to Europe do what? They land on the Sinai Peninsula. Quail land there to this day. Rejuvenate for about 24 to 48 hours and fly on to Europe. The author is at pains to say that it's the timing that is of significance. In the morning dew lay round the camp and when the dew had gone up <clears throat> There was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as hoarfrost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What well, is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which Yahweh has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it every man of you as much as can, he can eat. Take an omer apiece. There's, uh, in Numbers, what is it? Numbers 11, I think. Numbers 11, and the people complained in the hearing of Yahweh about the misfortunes. And when Yahweh heard of it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of Yahweh burned among them and consumed some outlying parts of the camp. Then the people cried to Moses, and Moses prayed to Yahweh, and the fire abated. The name of that place was Tibera because of the fire, which means burning, which uh, Yahweh burned among them. Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving, and the people of Israel wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now the manna was like a coriander seed, and its appearance was like delium. The people went about and gathered it, and ground it in mills to beat it in mortars, and boil it in pots, and made cakes of it. The taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. The dew fell on the camp in the night, and the manna fell with it. Uh, peop, uh, Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, every man at the door of his tent, and the anger of Yahweh blazed hotly, and, and Moses was displeased, and so forth. There's the other. Now, in the Numbers account, then, when does the manna begin? And when does the, the quail come? Hmm? 
In verse 31 of Numbers 11, they went forth, they went forth a wind from Yahweh and it brought quails from the sea and let them fall beside the camp. Where is Numbers 11? Where are we in the Exodus in Numbers 11? Well, just read the heading. Chronologically, where is Numbers 11? Numbers 11 says this is how the quail came and this is how the manna came. And where is it? Chronologically. I hope it's before Sinai. <laughs> That's the question I'm asking. That's the question I'm asking. Unfortunately, this is Numbers... Yes, Numbers, Numbers 10, verse 11. In the second year, in the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle of the testimony, and the people of Israel set out by stages from the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud settled down in the wilderness of Paran. Uh, in Numbers, the same events occur. The quail come, and the manna begins, only it begins just after they set out from Sinai. In Exodus, these same things happen, but what? Yeah, just before they arrive at Sinai. Okay. It's two different settings for the same story. Okay, now I'm sure you've all read Exodus and Numbers before, I've never noticed that, but there it is. That's because of the way it was edited together. Okay. We'll come back to. The Are you going to keep talking about that? No, I'm going to go on from that and let you. you know. uh, the you spoke of the the quail that landed as a natural phenomenon. There was nothing natural about the descending of the man, though. That there was no natural phenomenon that paralleled that. I hope. Now, why do you hope that? You weren't here to listen to us talk about the plagues, but the plagues, except for the certain the last plagues were things that happened in a normal sequence. It was that God took control of the sequence to show them that he was in control. Uh, terabith trees bear fruit and uh, there's, a, there's a, a terabith louse, if you can be, believe it, a, uh, an insect that's part of the uh, family that lice are from that bore into the fruit and they eat the fruit and they exude something that's similar to honey only it's flaky and it flakes underneath the it's the droppings now that's not that bad we eat honey and that's droppings too it's the insect droppings the, what honey's the leavings of a bee <laughs> what did it, what it exuded after it ate right what you just don't like it put that way right well, this thing, um, it hardens at night when it freezes, and it's flaky, it's almost opaque, and it melts in the sunshine, and it runs like honey. You ever heated up honey? It's very watery, right? And put it in the refrigerator, and what? Heads up. But this thing is flaky, and you can mill it. And on the Sinai Peninsula, sometimes, some years, it is said that there's almost none of this at all. But other years, it's gathered in great quantities around the terebinth trees, and it is milled and made into a kind of a cake, flat cake, that looks like bread but isn't bread at all, of course, because this stuff is not, in fact, uh, a grain. Uh, that is certainly manna. Okay. <coughs> but what was the key? Hmm, yeah as it is all the way through Exodus. And quantities. And quantity, yes. And in fact it does, uh, it doesn't store well. It does go rancid very quickly in the heat. Um, which is to say that were we to make the effort, we could go over to the Sinai Peninsula and get some passes and go down there and get some manna <coughs> right now if we wanted to sometime in the next week or two because it's the manna season. Okay. Um, that ain't 
What? No. No. <laughs> That's a an old legend, huh? Um, let's look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, <clears throat> give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their, gener from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of Yahweh and his might and the wonders which he has wrought. And here's a direct reference to oral tradition. There are a number of them in the Old Testament. References to oral tradition. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. The Ephraimites, armed with the bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot what he had done and the miracles that he had shown them. In the sight of their fathers, he wrought marvels, in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan, he divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the water stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all the night with a fiery light. He cleft rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He smote the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also provide bread or provide meat for his people? Therefore, when Yahweh heard, he was full of wrath. A fire was kindled against Jacob, and his anger mounted against Israel, because they had no faith in God and did not trust his saving power. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven, and he rained down upon them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate the bread of the angels and sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he led out the south wind. He rained flesh upon them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the sea. He let them fall in the midst of their camp, all around their habitations. And they ate and were filled, and he gave them what they had craved. But before they had sated their cravings, while the food was still in their mouths, the anger of God rose against them, and he slew the strongest of them, and laid low the picked troops of Israel. In spite of all this, they still, still sinned, despite his wonders, they did not believe. So he made their days vanish like a breath, and their years in terror. When he slew them, he, they sought for him. They repented and sought God earnestly. They remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer. But they flattered him with their mouths. They lied to him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not true to his covenant. Yet he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. He remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes and comes not again. How often they rebelled against him in the desert and grieved him in the desert. They tested him again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not keep in mind his power or the days when he redeemed them from the foe, when he wrought his signs in Egypt and his miracles in the fields of Zoan. So he turned their rivers to blood so that they could not drink of their streams. 
He sent among them swarms of flies which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He gave their crops to the caterpillar and the fruit of their labor to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamores with frost. He gave over their cattle to hail and their flocks to thunderbolts. He let loose on them his fierce anger, wrath, indignation, and distress, a company of destroying angels. He made a path for his anger. He did not spare them from death. He gave their lives over to the plague. He smote all the firstborn of Egypt, the first issue of their strength in the tents of Ham. He led forth his people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He led them in safety so that they were not afraid, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies, and he brought them to his holy land, to the mountain which his right hand had won. Do you noticing? I hope you're taking note. He drove out nations before them. He apportioned them for a possession and settled the tribes of Israel in their tents. Yet they tested and rebelled against God Most High and did not observe his testimonies, but turned away and acted treacherously like their fathers. They twisted like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard he was full of wrath, he utterly rejected Israel. He forsook his dwelling at Shiloh, a tent where he had dwelt among men, and delivered his power to captivity, his glory to the hand of the foe. He gave his people over to the sword and vented his wrath on his heritage. Fire devoured their young men, and their maidens had no marriage song. Their priests fell by the sword, and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awoke us from sleep, like a strong man shouting because of wine, and he put his adversaries to rout and put them to everlasting shame. He rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth which he has founded forever. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from tending the ewes that had the young had brought him to be the shepherd of Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. With upright heart he tended them and guided them with a skillful hand. Okay, now, this is a good example of the original poetic form of the Exodus. Here's the original poetry of the original uh, song that was sung of the original story of the Exodus. Now of course it has been cast into a story about the founding of the monarchy as the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel. And yes, it, uh, it makes use of these traditions but in a somewhat different way. Did you notice, where is the quail and the manna? Is it before or after Sinai? Well, one of the most interesting things about this is, as he tells you the high points, what's missing entirely? Totally, utterly, and completely missing is what? Sinai. The whole Sinai event is missing. And what's interesting is that again and again in the Psalms, and there are a number of Psalms about the Exodus, the whole Exodus event, they moved directly from out of Egypt into the land, the conquest of the land and the founding of the monarchy, and they never mentioned the Sinai event. It's just not important. Okay. Now then, what is interesting here is that when you get to Exodus, Sinai is big. The events at Sinai are big. And they're also inserted. They're inserted after the quail and manna in Exodus and before the quail and manna in Numbers. And the Sinai story is a story unto itself. It's put in slightly different place chronologically in the two different books. Well, that's just like uh, some of the other things that are slightly different, but the Sinai traditions, as they're called, uh, rest unto themselves and are separate from the wilderness march traditions. But where do you put the Sinai traditions in the wilderness march? Here in one book, there in another book. Okay, But the Sinai story was written as a separate event that got placed into the narrative of the wilderness march. Is everybody clear about this? And obviously it's a lot more important as time goes on than it was originally. Hmm. Yes. I probably missed something in the meeting, but which is the actual account and how important is it to us right now? 
numbers or Exodus, I hope? Uh, I don't know. I don't know which is the original cow. I don't know. So we, we don't know for I don't sure. know. I don't know. If the man, if the... Quail and manna came before or after Sinai? I don't know. I really don't know. See, historically, we have placed a lot of emphasis on this. No, we? well, but you see, why is it important to us? Because in Exodus 16, the whole business about the Sabbath, gathering twice and so forth, is the Sabbath before Sinai. That's why it's important to us. We like the way it is in Exodus. As Adventists, we want to make sure that Exodus is right and Numbers is wrong. Why? Because we want the Sabbath to exist before Sinai. Exodus 16 is a, is, is a proof text for us. Okay? So we don't like Numbers 11. Because Numbers 11, it would make all the sense in the world to mention gathering twice on Friday. Why? Because it's after, the, after Sinai. They've got the fourth commandment already. Then you don't, the man gathering sticks, you don't have anything. The, the man gathering sticks on the Sabbath and, and, and all that. You don't have any Sabbath before Sinai in the narrative. Is it important? Well, not very. Where's the Sabbath? Where's the Sabbath? Genesis, Genesis 1, creation. The priestly account is the Sabbath is a creation. Has no, in the priestly account, the Sabbath has nothing to do with Sinai. Right? And that's one reason it was left out, because the priestly account didn't want the Sabbath and all this other stuff. The priestly writer did not want the Sabbath and the whole sanctuary system to be tied to Sinai. The priestly writers didn't want all that stuff tied to Sinai. Why? We saw it in Genesis, we saw it all the way through. Where did all that stuff come from, as far as they were concerned? That came from creation. It did not come from Sinai. So, as a result, the priestly writers emphasized, and in the building of the books in the temples, they emphasized that these things came from creation. Okay? It's only in the election of Israel and the, and the emphasis on Israel as special people and the special covenant that Sinai becomes important. Right? And that became important when Israel was struggling with the nations. Right? When Israel was struggling with the nations, then God elected Israel and the election was at Sinai. Right? Okay. Yes, I, I, when you say, I hope it's Exodus, I understand. We're, as Exodus, we want Exodus 16 to be the exact chronological narrative sequence as it actually happened. Uh, not the way it's laid out in numbers. But that's because we have an axe to grind that the writer did not. Well, yes, <laughs> that's right. We, we're fighting with those Church of God people and Baptists and so forth about the Sabbath. But I'm not why sure should that be a grind. If, why should that be a problem when we know it existed in creation? Well, yes, that's my answer. I don't but care what our good Baptist brother will tell us. But, but see, your good Baptist brother is a fundamentalist. He doesn't... This is... Oh, I, oh I'm, I'm about to say something on tape. <laughs> he doesn't know that there's a problem between Exodus 16 and Numbers 11, hopefully, right? Hopefully. Because, yeah. because as a fundamentalist, what? There's no discrepancies in the Bible. None whatever. This, he, as soon as we hinted that there were some, he walked out the door. So he's not here. Right? And of course, uh, yeah, if you're a fundamentalist, you don't have this problem because you just ignore these things. You just pretend they're not there. <laughs> yes, so our proof text would be in trouble if we read Psalm 78 to him. Because in Psalm 78, um, it's after... This is not good. This is not good, what I'm about to say. It's after Moses strikes the rock and the water flows out like rivers that they test him further to see if he can provide bread and meat. Right? Uh, Psalm 78, verse 17. No, no. I take it back. Verse 15. He cleft the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. That's referring to Moses striking the rock, right? 
He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. Now this, this is the, this is the numbers form of the story. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the wilderness? He smote the rocks so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat? The bread is the manna and the meat is the quail. Is it before or after Sinai in Psalm 78? Yeah. It's after. Yeah. You're shaking your head. But that's still yeah. what you uh, two before one. <laughs> well, no, actually, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 78 isn't the only psalm about the Exodus. What? Realistically, there still shouldn't be a problem. Oh, uh, no, no. No, I don't raise these things to make problems. Yeah. I'm just pointing out that the account, the, as we have it in Exodus, and we use it as a proof text, we probably shouldn't. Okay. Well, that's a oh, yeah. The, 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 the theology of the priests is that it came with creation, that's it. The Lord could have rained down the manna before and then after as well. Yeah, except that it doesn't say he did it before and after. You see, there's no way that the people could be demanding meat in the second year and the second month after the Exodus and asking can God give us meat and, and and what are we going to eat if they'd already been having man all along right well, did they have enough supplies to last until this late man <laughs> late man <manna>, no <laughs> yeah. what are we doing now what are we doing now we've got two different accounts and what are we trying to do Right, the the Lord. What? Oh, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Let's quote Mrs. White. God hasn't put himself on trial in the Bible. God hasn't put himself in words in the Bible, right? This is a, we're looking at Bible editors. We have, this has nothing to do with the word of the Lord. Uh, the word of the Lord is here, but we're talking about chronology. And after all, <laughs> this is important to us because who made a proof text out of Exodus 16. 19th century, so Yes, that's right. Is this a proof text anywhere in the New Testament? No. No, look, I understand that you, what, now you're trying to get the accounts together. So you want to be a third uh, Bible writer now who, who writes a different story. And your story is going to be what? Right one. And it's going to say what? Before they got manna before, they got manna after. Well, is that but, possible? But the problem is that they couldn't be surprised and shocked by the manna. And they couldn't be asking for meat and saying, how are we going to get meat in the wilderness? How on earth are we going to find meat in the wilderness if this thing had already happened to them last year? Well, the name is a giveaway. I mean, it, it's not really a name. It's, it's, what is it? Yes. Um, yeah. You can't. So if they've been eating it for a year. Why would they call yeah. it? What is it? Yeah, you can't. You can't call so, You can't call something. What is it? After a year, you can say you can call it the same old stuff. Maybe that's the name you could give it. But you could. <laughs> yes, you could call it angel leftover food, but you couldn't say what is it. You saw the line of poetry there. The poet, of course, is trying to emphasize how ungrateful they were. And so, in, in, in poetic lines, what does he say? And you know, I don't have to give you a lecture, do I? I'm not literalizing poetry, right? Because if you took everything in, in the Psalms as literal, you'd have some really funny things, right? That's sort of like trying to literalize one of Jesus' parables. Yeah, you can't use a proof text in, in Psalm 78 and say, you see, this is the food that the angels ate. Right? But... I know. Did, 
You see, that's the trouble. I was looking at him and my words went right past you. <laughs> what? No, see, he's sitting between you and I was talking to him and my words went right between both of you. You, you both missed it. <laughs> Didn't I just say this? I'm going to try this again. I'm going to try. <laughs> now I'm going to try this again. The psalmist in Psalm 78 is making a point that Israel rebelled how long? There's no honeymoon period in Psalm 78. When did they start rebelling? Right away. Right? And they got worse and worse and worse. Again and again and again. And he is using words to emphasize how awful they were. And he's writing poetry. Right? Okay. And so in this poetry, he mentions the... Now, let's use this, a different verse as an example. Verse 15. He cleft rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rocks and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Well, is that exactly what happened? Water came out of the rock, but it didn't gush out like rivers. They weren't all swept away. They didn't all go down the wadi swimming for their lives, did they? This is poetry. Oh yes, it was sufficient, but that is, he's not talking about sufficiency here. What is he saying? What's he saying here? Yeah, it's, it's, he's using hyperbole. You know what hyperbole is? Okay, this is typical of, of poetry. All right. Uh, a fire was kindled against Jacob, verse 21. You understand the fire is, is God's wrath. Verse 23, he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. We've seen these phrasing a lot. Is there a door in heaven that you open? Yeah, but I'm not sure that's the way God gets his blessings. It's not, it's not, you, you, it's not literal, you understand? It's, okay. <laughs> Man ate the bread of the angels and sent them food in abundance. Well, it's a parallel couplet. And you see what he means by the first line by looking at the second line. He sent them food in abundance.